This is the lesson on direct laryngoscopy for the MICU airway management class. Well, this is the thing, this is the big uh, thrilling moment we're all interested in. We talked about airway evaluation, we talked about being prepared, about the medications and stuff. And now, okay, so it's time to put the tube in, okay? We've masked, we've done everything, we have everything ready, so now let's talk about what makes for a successful intubation. Head position is key. You really want to get the patient in a sniffing position. So a sniffing position like this. The idea is to range their head as much as possible so you have the straightest possible axis into the trachea. I'm going to do the exact opposite. What happens if I put my head back like this? All right, now, I mean, there's just no way. I mean, in addition to having many double chins here, there's no way I'm going to get in this way. This is the worst possible position. This gives me the best possible position. That's what you want to get in the sniffing position. So my head is forward like that. And likewise, you want to get them in a good position. Now, a lot of times if people have a big BMI, you need to sort of ramp them up. You need to build up their shoulders and build it up. Whatever you have to ahead of time to get their head in good position, the better the head position, the less skilled you have to be in laryngoscopy. And you want to have everything working for you, okay? So you see how I've got this in a really good position, whereas something like this would be, you know, the exact wrong position. So head position, very, very key thing. Curved blade or straight blade? Well, you can intubate with either. There, the, with the curved blade, of course, we're going to go down and we're going to lift up in front of the epiglottis. Whereas if we had a straight blade, we would go and actually lift the epiglottis itself. Now, a mistake so many people make, I'll show you the close-up here, is they really don't get to the side. They really don't get to the side. They sort of stay in the middle. And then when they try to look, see how the tongue will just kind of slide over? The tongue's very wet. And the tongue will slide over, and now you're not getting much of a view at all. So I get his head in good position. By the way, obviously in these and all things, I would have gloves on. But for just for the teaching purposes and not to create a lot of waste, but obviously you would have gloves on anytime you do this procedure. So I can either get the head in good position like this, or I can scissors the mouth open. Notice when I scissors the mouth open, I go like this. It's surprising how many beginners you see will go like this. There's not much, you can't really generate much energy that way. You scissors the mouth open like this, scissors the mouth open, and put the laryngoscope to the right of the tongue. Put it way to the right. Again, in beginning mistake land, you sort of put it in the middle and the tongue is always sliding over, sliding over, sliding over, getting in your way. Put this really all the way to the right. You put it all the way to the right and then lift along the direction of the handle. Notice I'm lifting along the direction of the handle. This keeps me away from the upper teeth and affords me the best view. If I crank back, you hear that clicking sound? I'm clicking against the teeth. Plus, if I crank back, I'm actually cutting off my view. So let's say I have a pretty good view. Here's a little larynx here. I have a pretty good view. But if I crank back like that, you see how I've just blocked off my view? I got a pretty good view. If I crank back, I've not only damaged the teeth, I've cut off my own view. So once you get the view, and again, you lift. You might have to come back a little. The epiglottis pops down, and then you lift again. Now, I usually try to come in from the side a little bit so that I don't obscure my view. Slide it through the cords. Do you need to have a stylet? I would argue that you do. Some, some would say you don't always need it, but I think it's a good idea to have a stylet. You need to have just enough nature to be able to make that turn. You don't want to be going boink, boink, boink. Remember, every time you go, that's friable mucosa down there. It's very delicate vascular stuff. If I'm going like this a whole lot of times, I'm going to stir up a lot, a lot of bleeding. And then it gets edematous, and then it's hard to see, and then I, and you just end up with a vicious circle. So as much as possible, try to be real, real gentle with this stuff. You want to lubricate the endotracheal tube before you put it in. Okay. Once that's in, watch this. I could be careless and just yank the endotracheal tube up, but the tooth doesn't care if, you know, if it gets chipped going in or coming out. Careless like that is going to cause damage. Just as you are careful putting it in, watch this. I'm going to kind of exaggerate. Be careful coming out. Be 
careful coming out. Don't just go pink, because I've seen teeth get broken that way too. And now you, notice how I hang on to the endotracheal tube here. I mean, you went through all the trouble to put it in. When you pull that stylet out, make sure you hold on to it. Again, I've, I've seen everything in my day, but I've seen people pull the whole thing out when they're pulling out the stylet, and you don't want that to happen. So now, let's say this thing is in, pull the stylet out, then you're going to inflate the pilot balloon and make sure that you're in the right place. Now, this is being prepared for MICU fellow, so you know this stuff, but I'll throw out a few things in case, say, someone at a more beginning level is starting out. How are you going to know you're in the right place? You're going to see the chest rise. You're going to hear bilateral breath sounds. You're going to hook up an end tidal CO2 uh, monitor and make sure that you see end tidal CO2. The usual portable, portable kind we use at codes and stuff, you'll see it goes from a purple color to a gold color. So we'll hook it up and we'll say, oh, we're golden. Um, there are a few exceptions when, when it wouldn't turn gold, but we don't really need to go into that now. So you make sure you're in the right place and then hook up your, your ventilator. So now let's just talk a little bit about why, as it sometimes happens, right after you intubate them, boom, they crash. Now why should that be? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, with your first positive pressure ventilation, if someone's volume status is pretty marginal, you've just impeded their venous return. You've just gone from the normal mode of ventilation, where the patient has their own thoracic pump pulling the fluid up for them, to now a positive pressure thing, where suddenly we're impeding their venous return. And patients will sometimes crash with that. When you induce, people do give medications, and, and that's actually the subject of another uh, talk. But the different medications are, to various extents, depressants. So you give a depressant, now you impede venous return, and surprise, surprise, the patient crashes. And a final one is a little more nebulous, but kind of easy to understand. If you're intubating someone, they're obviously in trouble. I mean, surprise, surprise. So someone might be in a very high adrenergic state. Their sympathetic system is really going crazy because they're hypoxic and they're in a bad way and, and stuff. Now you relax them, you give them a sedative, suddenly they're not in distress, now they're, they're not worried anymore because they're, they're unconscious, and it's, it's almost as if they, they were on an epinephrine drip, and then suddenly the epinephrine drip is turned off. Suddenly that high adrenergic state is gone, and boom, their pressure crashes out. So that's one thing to be very aware of. We don't do things in boxes. Okay, I intubated him, that's good. It's all one thing. So you have to be aware when you intubate, then you might get a big hemodynamic fall. Be aware as well that a lot of these people we're going to intubate are people who have heart disease. And just as you can crash them out one way, you can crash them out the other way too. If you're nervous about someone and you don't give enough uh, medication to blunt the sympathetic response to intubation, Right after you intubate them, surprise, surprise, the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, and now you might push the person into ischemia land. So very much a part of intubation, we're not just intubating uh, devices, part of intubating is being aware that I might crash this person on the downside, and I might stress this person on the upside because this is a very, very sympathetically interesting time when you're intubating someone. I'm going to show you on the mannequin a few things you can do if things don't go right. So in a perfect world, you get them in a perfect position, you put the laryngoscope in, you get a great view, tube goes in, life is good. But you know, life doesn't always work out that way. So you might go in and you don't have any view at all. So what do you do in that case? What do you do when you just don't get any view at all? Well, first I'm going to show you the wrong thing to do. The wrong thing to do is to keep trying, 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 trying to get that tube in. That's going to cause bleeding, edema, it's going to be a nightmare. Maybe you can't even get it. The next person that comes along is going to have to handle this nightmare. What you want to do is if things don't go right, first of all, buy yourself a little time. There's an old saying, you don't have to intubate, you only have to ventilate. Pull the laryngoscope out, give them some mask ventilation. Again, the importance of mask ventilation. There, now you've got the patient resaturated. Now, the whole idea is change something. Don't reinforce failure. If I have the exact same head position, exact same blade, and exact same practitioner, 
Do I really think things are going to change? No. I mean, I'm just reinforcing failure. Change something. Put their head up more. Uh, get a different blade. Get a different person. Never be so proud. Never be so proud to not ask for help. Ask for it. Look, uh, something, I can't see it very well. I don't know how many times I've done it. Someone else comes along, boom, they get the tube in right away. I would rather swallow my pride than hurt a patient. So change something, and that includes change the blade, change the head position. Most often, head position is what does it for you. You change the head position, and life gets better. Uh, do something different. Don't reinforce failure. Uh, you might also want to, if, you, if you've really exhausted your efforts at this stuff, then go to something else. Go to an LMA or go to a fiber optic. Good, this is review, good head position, way to the right, lift, the epiglottis comes down, lift again, and put the tube in. You notice this wasn't, this isn't a muscle affair. This is not, this is not a strongman contest. If, the idea is to do this with technique. See, my, my, I can do this with just my thumb and my finger. If you get it to the right, and then just lift a little. That really helped. I'm going to do one last trick for, for helping you out. Uh, actually, two last tricks. Let's say I can't quite get the view. Sometimes this helps. You reach up with your hand, your right hand, and you push down. A lot of times this will bring the cords in your, in your view. The cords will tend to, if anything, run away. They'll run away anteriorly. And sometimes you can reach and push down and get it into view. When you do that, obviously you're going to reach away to get the endotracheal tube. That's when you ask someone, hey, come over here, put your hand just like this. And have them put their hand just like that, and that will allow you to put it in. And now the final trick that helps a lot of times, and that is use of an intubating bougie. The thing that gets us most often is the fact that the cords are just a little too anterior. We just can't quite... We just can't quite make it up there, okay? And that's where the bougie really comes in handy. You see this little tilt up here? It goes like this, and then I'm exaggerating. It tilts up, tilts up. That's what allows you to get the endotracheal tube in. This has really helped us out a lot. If you don't quite have the view, you don't, you don't quite have the view, don't quite have the view, you can put the bougie in and slide underneath. You see how the bougie has now slid between the cords? I'll show you how that works. Obviously, you can't have the stylet in when you're going to have the bougie. So let's see how that works. Good head position, all the rest. I put the laryngoscope in. I just, I just don't quite have the view that I want. In spite of, of, of all the, I've done all the right things. So then I take my bougie, I take my bougie, slide that in, put that through the cords, and then once this is through the cords, I can slide the endotracheal tube down it. Now, I like to keep the laryngoscope in to make sure I can follow this all the way in. Make sure this thing goes all the way in there. So that way, there's, you, you don't bounce it out. But the bougie is a great device and should always be around whenever you're planning on direct laryngoscopy. I try to emphasize to, to people, especially when they're first learning, using the bougie is not a crutch. It's not a sign of weakness. If you need the bougie, use the bougie. The bougie is there for a reason. The day will come when maybe you don't need a bougie, but if you ever need it, I'd much rather have you use the bougie and have the endotracheal tube in than to not use the bougie and be turning to me and making a long explanation. So bougie, very, very handy device. All right, that concludes uh, direct laryngoscopy uh, for the uh, MICU Fellows Airway course.